Hi, Internet. It's 8 o'clock. We're live. This is my face. This is the book we're going to read. It's chapter 16 of Glinda of Oz. And tonight's chapter is entitled The Enchanted Fishes. I must now tell you what happened to Ervik and the other three skeezers who were left floating in the iron boat after Queen Kuyo had been transformed into a diamond swan by the magic of the flathead Sudik. The four skeezers were all young men, and their leader was Ervik. Kuyo had taken them with her in the boat to assist her if she captured the flathead chief, as she hoped to do by means of her silver rope. They knew nothing about the witchcraft that moved the submarine, and so, when left floating upon the lake, they were at a loss what to do. The submarine could not be submerged by them or made to return to the sunken island. There were neither oars nor sails in the boat, which was not anchored, but drifted quietly upon the surface of the lake. The Diamond Swan had no further thought or care for her people. She had sailed over to the other side of the lake, and all the calls and pleadings of Ervik and his companions were unhealed, or unheeded by the vain bird. As there was nothing else for them to do, they sat quietly in their boat and waited as patiently as they could for someone to come to their aid. The Flatheads had refused to help them and had gone back to their mountain. All the skeezers were imprisoned in the Great Dome and could not even help themselves. <clears throat> When evening came, they saw the diamond swan, still keeping to the opposite shore of the lake, walk out of the water to the sands, shake her diamond-sprinkled feathers, and then disappear among the bushes to seek a resting place for the night. "'I'm hungry,' said Ervik. "'I'm cold,' said another skeezer. "'I'm tired,' said a third. "'I'm afraid,' said the last of them. But it did them no good to complain. Night fell, and the moon rose and cast a silvery sheen over the surface of the water." "'Go to sleep,' said Ervik to his companions. "'I'll stay awake and watch, for we may be rescued in some unexpected way.' So the other three laid themselves down in the bottom of the boat, and were soon fast asleep. Ervik watched. He rested himself by leaning over the bow of the boat, his face near to the moonlit water, and thought dreamily of the day's surprising events, and wondered what would happen to the prisoners in the Great Dome. Suddenly a tiny goldfish popped its head above the surface of the lake, not more than a foot from his eyes. A silverfish then raised its head beside that of the goldfish, and a moment later, a bronze fish lifted its head beside the others. The three fish, all in a row, looked earnestly with their round, bright eyes into the astonished eyes of Ervik the skeezer. "'We are the three adepts whom Queen Kuyo betrayed and wickedly transformed,' said the goldfish, its voice low and soft, but distinctly heard in the stillness of the night." "'I know of our queen's treacherous deed,' replied Ervik, "'and I feel sorry for your misfortune. "'Have you been in the lake ever since?' "'Yes,' was the reply. "'I hope you are well and comfortable,' stammered Ervik, "'not knowing what else to say. "'We knew that some day Kuyo would meet with the fate "'that she so richly deserves,' declared the bronzefish. "'We have waited and watched for this time. "'Now if you will promise to help us, we will be faithful and true.' You can aid us in regaining our natural forms and save yourself and all your people from the dangers that now threaten you. Well, said Ervik, you can depend on my doing the best I can, but I'm no witch or magician, you must know. All we ask is that you obey our instructions, returned the silverfish. We know that you are honest, and that you served Kuyo only because you were obliged to in order to escape her anger. Do as we command, and all will be well. <coughs> I promise, exclaimed the young man. Tell me what I'm to do first. You will find at the bottom of your boat the silver cord which dropped from Kuyo's hand when she was transformed, said the goldfish. To one end of that cord to the tie one end of that cord to the bow of your boat and drop the other end to us in the water. Together we will pull your boat to shore. Ervik much doubted that the three small fishes could move so heavy a boat. But he did as he was told, and the fishes all seized their end of the silver cord in their mouths and headed toward the nearest shore, which was the very place where the flatheads had stood when they conquered Queen Kuyo. At first the boat did not move at all. Although the fishes pulled with all their strength, but presently the strain began to tell. Very slowly the boat crept toward the shore, gaining more speed at every moment. A couple yards away from the sandy beach, the fishes dropped the cord from their mouths and swam to one side, while the iron boat... Being now under way, continued to move until its prow grated upon the sands. Ervik leaned over the side and said to the fishes, What next? You will find upon the sand, said the silverfish, a copper kettle, 
which the Sudik forgot when he went away. Cleanse it thoroughly in the water of the lake, for it has poison in it. When it is cleaned, fill it with fresh water and hold it over the side of your boat so that we three may swim into the kettle. We will then instruct you further. Do you wish me to catch you then? asked Ervik in surprise. Yes, was the reply. So Ervik jumped out of the boat and found the copper kettle. Carrying it a little way down the beach, he washed it well, scrubbing away every drop of the poison it had contained with sand from the shore. Then he went back to the boat. Ervik's comrades were still sound asleep and knew nothing of the three fishes or what strange happenings were taking place about them. Ervik dipped the kettle in the lake, holding fast to the handle until it was underwater. The gold and silver and bronze fishes promptly swam into the kettle. The young skeezer then lifted it, poured out a little of the water so that it would not spill over the edge, and said to the fishes, What next? Carry the kettle to the shore. Take one hundred steps to the east along the edge of the lake. Then you will see a path leading through the meadow. Up and hill, uphill and down dale. Follow the path until you come to a cottage which is painted a purple color with white trimmings. When you stop at the gate of this cottage, we will tell you what to do next. Be careful, above all, not to stumble and spill the water from the kettle, or you will destroy us all. Or you will destroy us, and all you have done would be in vain. The goldfish issued these commands, and Ervik promised to be careful and started to obey. He left his sleeping comrades in the boat, stepping cautiously over their bodies, and on reaching the shore, took exactly one hundred steps to the east. Then he looked for the path, and the moonlight was so bright that he easily discovered it, although it was hidden from view by tall woods until one came full upon it. This path was very narrow and did not seem to be much use, but it was quite distinct, and Ervik had no difficulty in following it. He walked through a broad meadow covered with tall grass and weeds, up a hill and down into a valley, and then up another hill and down again. It seemed to Ervik that he'd walked miles and miles. Indeed, the moon sank low and day was beginning to dawn when finally he discovered by the roadside a pretty little cottage, painted purple with white trimmings. It was a lovely place. No other buildings were anywhere about, and the ground was not tilted or was not tilled at all. No farmer lived here, that was certain. Who would care to dwell in such an isolated place? But Ervik did not bother his head long with such questions. He went up to the gate that led to the cottage, set the copper kettle carefully down, bending over it, and asked, What next? Oh, that is the end of chapter 16. The Three Fishes. Is that what it was called? I can't remember. I'm not good at this. I'm sorry. The Enchanted Fishes. Tomorrow night, right here on Facebook, we're going to read chapter 17, Under the Great Dome. I hope you'll join us then, everybody. Good night.